Well, first, a uh, big thanks to all the organizers and, and you all for having me at this school. Uh, I actually haven't left the U.S. since the pandemic, so it's uh, especially nice to be here. Also, my first time to San Sebastian. Uh, maybe I can start by trying to put my uh, lectures in broader context for the school. Uh, so in Adam's lectures earlier this week, he gave a beautiful overview of the mathematical foundations of non-abelian anions, one of my favorite topics in physics. And non-abelian anions were introduced as theoretical concepts back in the early 1980s. And a few years after that, the first candidate experimental non-abelian anion platform emerged in the form of what's now called the uh, Moore-Reed fractional quantum Hall phase. And then around 10 years later, in the early 2000s, there was a, a critical conceptual leap made by Reed and Green and, uh, and Kataev, uh, who, who observed that the essential non-abelian content of that strongly correlated fractional quantum Hall phase could be distilled down to uh, weakly cor correlated systems, namely one-dimensional and two-dimensional topological superconductors. And actually, as, as Charlie uh, described in his second lecture yesterday, uh, you can actually describe those superconductors uh, within free fermion Hamiltonians. And that sounds like, a, you know, how could that possibly be true? It sounds, it sounds wild that you could find anything remotely non-abelian-like in the context of free fermion Hamiltonians, but we'll, we'll see how that kind of thing arises, hopefully, in a reasonably intuitive way. So that's, that, that'll be the focus of my lectures. I'm going to uh, go into more detail of uh, one-dimensional and two-dimensional topological superconductors, which are already uh, uh, beautifully introduced by, uh, by Charlie yesterday. So I'll uh, um, describe uh, in as unified way as I can, you know, 1D and 2D uh, topological superconductors. I'll try to give uh, physical meaning to the Majorana zero modes, which are ultimately what allows non-abelian anion physics to emerge there, uh, what, what, what those things actually mean. I'll uh, say some things about how non-abelian uh, statistics can arise, how one can form topological qubits uh, using, uh, using topological superconductors. And at the end, assuming I, I make it that far, I will um, say some things about how you can probe uh, um, via transport and Josephson effects, the uh, essential uh, non-abelian content of topological superconductors. So one thing I will not cover at all is experimental platforms. Uh, I believe that that will be covered in, in Charlie Marcus and or Addie Stern's uh, lectures, um, maybe even uh, this, this afternoon. Okay, so one thing I can say is, uh, you know, I'm on the blackboard. I hope to make this as interactive as possible, and please feel free to interrupt me often, as often as you like, uh, during, uh, during the, any of my lectures. All right, so with that, I'm going to start with uh, the by far simplest model that you can write down for a one-dimensional topological superconducting phase, which is the Kataev chain. Again, I think uh, many people are already familiar with this, and I guess everyone saw it uh, yesterday in, in, Charlie's, uh, in Charlie's talk. So there will be a little bit of repetition, but as my lectures go, I think the repetition will, will uh, get less and less. All right, so the basic setup, we're going to start with a, a set of spinless fermions. The fact that they're spinless is all important for this discussion. Uh, so the spinless fermions are going to uh, live on an n-site chain, and I'm going to assume, at least uh, for now, that, uh, that uh, one has periodic boundary conditions. All right, so these are just sites of, uh, of an n-site chain, which I'll label 1, 1 to n. And the physical input, so we have uh, spinless fermions living. Uh, site 1 is going to be connected to site n because I'm using periodic boundary conditions. And there's basically two kinds of processes that I'll allow for uh, in this model. So I'll allow for uh, spinless fermions to hop between nearest neighbor sites of the chain with some amplitude t. And I'll allow... Uh, fermions on uh, nearest neighbor sites to form Cooper pairs with some amplitude delta. All right, and and uh, that's the simplest kind of pairing term that you can write down. Basically, poly exclusion principle prevents you from having uh, an on-site pairing because you have no spin degree of freedom. Okay. okay, so here's the Hamiltonian. The sum over sites uh, that are labeled by x. So we'll give those spinless fermions that I'll describe with uh, operators uh, CX and CX dagger. We'll give them a chemical potential. And just for later convenience, 
I'm going to introduce a factor of uh, one half in the hopping and pairing terms. So the hopping term will look like t c x dagger c x plus one. And then there's going to be a pairing term again, just for later convenience. I'll put a minus sign in front of there. That's not important. Uh, times c x dagger c x plus one dagger. And then we have to add the Hermitian conjugate to make it uh, a real Hamiltonian. And just to make uh, life simple, I'm going to assume that uh, uh, t and delta are both real, uh, real numbers. Okay, so we have periodic boundary conditions, which implies that we have translation symmetry. In general, you should always take advantage of whatever symmetries your problem admits. And we can efficiently exploit uh, translation symmetry by uh, passing to momentum space. And when you rewrite this Hamiltonian in momentum space, you get the following form. There's a sum on momentum uh, confined to the 1D Brillouin zone. Uh, this uh, CK factor is going to be this, uh, the uh, band energy uh, minus the chemical potential. And then we'll have the uh, pairing piece, which I'll write as uh, 1 half some function delta k that I'll define for you in a second, times ck dagger c minus k dagger plus Hermitian conjugate. OK, so there's the Hamiltonian in k space. Let me define for you these uh, ck and uh, delta k factors. OK, so ck is just going to be minus t cosine k uh, minus mu. And delta k will be i delta times sine k. And maybe the one thing to highlight here is that uh, delta k is an odd function of momentum that's forced on us by the spinless uh, nature of our Cooper pairs, which I think is something that uh, Rosaire highlighted for us um, uh, last uh, yesterday. OK, so uh, from this uh, model, you can uh, use the techniques that you learned either from Charlie's or, or Rosaire's. Uh, lectures to uh, diagonalize uh, the Hamiltonian. You can write it in the form of a Bolguibar de Gen Hamiltonian, diagonalize a two by two matrix, which then gives you the excitation energies, single particle excitation energies. Okay, so they take the form EK uh, given by square root of. It's a ck squared plus delta k squared. OK, so this is now enough information to deduce uh, the, the structure of the phase diagram of this model as a function of uh, chemical potential divided by the uh, tunneling energy. Try to fit it over here. All right, so to do this, I'm going to start by just plotting the band energy across the 1D Brillouin zone. So the band energies are just minus T cosine K. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it looks like there's some such functionality. Um, OK, I can still reach. Uh, good check. All right, so thanks. So is this going to slide down? Or, OK, nice. All right, is this, is this better for people? Everyone, sorry about that. Um, there's also, by the way, some open chairs up front, if, if, that's, uh, if that's better. Um, all right, so this minus t cosine k, that's just the kinetic energy that you have from the hopping term. And if you plot this over the uh, Brillouin zone going from minus pi to pi, just a uh, usual uh, cosine form. And so what I now want to ask, I'd just you know, park my uh, chemical potential somewhere and ask a very basic question, is the uh, excitation spectrum gapped or gapless uh, at a given value of mu? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
probably was in my notes, I just uh, forgot to copy it. All right, so let's start with um, a situation where mu is actually below the band bottom. Um, so maybe I can try an experiment uh, asking you all if mu is here, it, and so there's my Hamiltonian, I find the ground state of that Hamiltonian. Is the uh, spectrum gapless or is it gapped? If, if that's mu. It's gapped, yeah, so for sure. So the only way that the excitation spectrum will be gapless is if CK and delta K are simultaneously non-zero. But actually, even if delta K, even if you turn off pairing, you, you start with an insulator, right? So CK is never uh, non-zero um, for, for mu below the band bottom. And so it's, it's hopeless to get anything that's, uh, that's gapless. So this uh, value of mu will give us a gapped phase. And I'd like us to uh, hopefully agree that that gap phase we should label as trivial. And the reason I say that is if you take mu, uh, the chemical potential to be minus infinity, so take it you know, all the way down you know, uh, to, the, to the basement and beyond, um, then you can actually ignore all these other, you know, the hopping and, and pairing terms, and uh, the this ground state is just smoothly deformable to a trivial product state with no fermions present. So that's the most trivial state you can imagine, it's just the fermion vacuum. Okay. So let's call that uh, trivial. And by the same token, if you have uh, mu above the uh, top of the band, that's also going to give you a gap state. It's, it's also trivial. It's, it's um, I guess, slightly less trivial in the sense that it's not vacuum, but it's still going to be a deformable to a product state where you just have one fermion at every side of the chain. Okay. So that's also gapped and trivial. All right, so then a uh, slightly more non-trivial question is what if the chemical potential actually slices uh, the band so that you have a partially occupied band that, uh, that you then add this uh, um, pairing to. So will that, if, I, if my chemical potential is there, will my system be gapped or gapless? So it's gapped once again, it's gapped. And uh, so in this case, you know, CK vanishes at the Fermi points here and here. But uh, delta K is non-zero at those Fermi points, okay? And so this will still be gapped. Essentially, you know, the moment you have uh, time reverse partners at the Fermi energy, you add a, a, a pairing term and, and, you know, that's all you need. Um, all right, so this is also gapped. And the question is whether that gapped phase that we get here is the same gap phase as, as the ones we labeled trivial, or is it, or is it a, a different phase? Sort of intuitively, it looks a bit different. You know, here you have a, a partially filled band that, that acquired a gap due to pairing. Out here, uh, you, you get a gap phase independent of whether you have uh, superconductivity or not. Um, now, you know, we can ask, uh, how can two gap phases be different? Um, and I, as far as I know, there's two possible ways, either because they have different symmetry or they're topologically distinct. All right, so the, the possibility of you know, this phase being distinct from those trivial states is, uh, um, I think we can rule out that symmetry distinguishes them. Basically, this is a free Fermi on the Hamiltonian. This, uh, the ground state here and the ground states here will have exactly the same symmetry. Right? Um, so that opens the door to them possibly being topologically distinct. All right. But to get, uh, to get additional insight there, we can ask whether you can uh, deform the gap state that you get when you have a partially filled band into one of these phases that we agreed are trivial uh, without closing, closing the excitation gap to the system. Okay. All right, so that's uh, maybe another question I can pose to you all. So if I, let's say, raise the chemical potential here or lower it here, can I uh, do so without uh, closing the gap? Yeah, exactly. So there are special values of the chemical potential here where you've, you're just sitting at the band bottom and here where you're just sitting at the uh, top of the, of the band at which uh, your system is actually gapless. Okay? Because at those points, uh, at either here, here, or here, both uh, CK and delta K will simultaneously vanish, uh, implying that you have gapless excitations. All right, so that's uh, evidence that, or at least some suggest suggestive evidence that uh, these states are not actually the same. They are you know, topologically uh, distinct, perhaps. 
And uh, indeed, that is the case. Um, all right, so this uh, phase that we get uh, when you have a partially filled band that becomes gap due to Cooper pairing is, is topologically non-trivial. And actually, I think in this situation, it's almost the simplest possible topological invariant that you can imagine, at least if you maintain k to minus k to, uh, symmetry in, the, uh, in these band energies. The topological invariant that distinguishes this phase from the trivial ones uh, nearby uh, has the form, let's call it nu, it's just minus one to the number of uh, pairs of Fermi points. OK, so uh, when we have um, chemical potential either below or above the band, we have no Fermi points. So this uh, exponent is 0, giving you new equals, uh, a topological invariant of new equals 1. When you're uh, in this uh, regime where the chemical potential uh, intersects the band, you have one pair of Fermi points. The one here, in, uh, well, there's your pair of Fermi points. And so the exponent is 1, corresponding to a topological invariant, which is uh, new equals minus 1. Okay. And you can, it's maybe useful to convince yourself that that uh, index will not actually change. You know, you can imagine deforming this band structure, at least if you provide, preserve k to minus k symmetry. Or you could do something perverse, like, you know, introduce uh, some, some curvature like this, change. And you can only change the number of pairs of Fermi points by an even number, right, which will always preserve this, uh, uh, this index. All right, so there's your topological invariant. OK, so which, let me then summarize the phase diagram. OK, so I'm going to draw this phase diagram as a function of mu over t. Maybe I should have labeled, so this point here is minus t, and that point here is, uh, is plus t. Those are the band edges. OK, so we get these gapless points at mu over t equals uh, plus or minus 1. So in this region, we get a trivial phase. In this region, we get a trivial phase. And in between, uh, we get a topological phase. Okay, so these uh, regions have new equals plus one. This region has new equals minus one. And just to inject some jargon that you may have come across or um, or may eventually come across, so this uh, trivial the trivial superconductors that you get out there those can those are sometimes called strong pairing or BEC like superconducting phases, whereas this topological phase is a weak pairing or BCS like uh, superconducting state. All right, and uh, topological phase transitions separating uh, those appear uh, occur at uh, mu over t equals plus or minus one. All right, so um, what I'd like to do now is is try to get at the universal features of these GATT phases and eventually the phase transition that uh, that separates them. And in order to really expose that uh, those universal features in the most convenient way possible. It's going to be very useful to fine-tune the parameters in our model such that uh, we set the pairing and, amplitude, uh, pairing and hopping amplitudes equal to each other. So for you know, describing an experiment, that's a rather preposterous limit to take unless you have a very unusual kind of system. Yeah, please. And why the, the, the state in the middle, when you put the mu in the middle, it was gapped? They don't understand that. Yeah, OK, so the, um, I can go back to this, this box equation here. So the only way that this is going to be 0 is if, because you're adding these things in, in quadrature, you need both ck and delta k to be 0 at the same momentum. Okay. Now this uh, ck can be non-zero. It is non-zero at the Fermi points. So that's kind of the definition of the Fermi points. So CK will be non-zero here. Zero. Sorry, zero. Uh, zero here and here. Thank you. Um, but uh, delta K is, is non-zero. Delta K is zero only at uh, K equals zero and, and plus or minus pi. OK. So okay. That's, that's, the, that's the logic. Anything else? 
All right, so you know, typically the kinetic energy scale is orders of magnitude bigger than the pairing energy scale for real superconductors. Um, and so I'm not trying to, uh, to say something about realistic parameter regime. As we'll see by, and I, actually I think as you already saw briefly in Charlie's talk, when you, uh, by specializing to this limit, the special features of the topological phase just fall out into your lap basically, and, and everything becomes uh, very transparent. And eventually I'll comment on what happens when you depart from this, uh, this fine-tuned limit and go to a more generic situation. Okay, but let's do that for now. Um, if you specialize to delta equals t, then uh, the Hamil real space Hamiltonian, which I unfortunately erased, I probably shouldn't have erased that board, uh, takes the following form. Okay, so once again, I have a sum on uh, x minus mu cx dagger cx, that's a chemical potential term. And in addition to that, I had our hopping and, and pairing terms, but now their amplitudes are exactly the same. And so I can recast those in the following form. So I'll, I'll pull out a, an overall energy scale t, which is now common to both types of terms. That becomes uh, cx dagger plus cx times cx plus 1 cx plus 1 minus cx plus 1 dagger. All right, so hopefully I got all the signs right there. And we can stare at this uh, factorized expression and see that indeed the, the same hopping and pairing terms that I wrote down previously are still there. So this, uh, this combination and this combination will give us the, the hopping terms that were originally in the Hamiltonian. And if you look at uh, these terms and these terms, those are the um, you know, nearest neighbor uh, Cooper pairing terms that we had in the Hamiltonian. All right, so this form will pay dividends uh, as we'll see. Okay, so I'd like to now um, focus in on these uh, gap superconductors. And in order to see what's really special about having a non-trivial non topological invariant, it's useful to move away from our periodic chain and consider open boundary conditions. Okay, so uh, in order to really see the new physics that emerges when we have open, open boundary conditions, it's going to be extremely illuminating to um, recast this model in using a so-called Majorana representation of our fermion operators. Okay, so I'm going to define take each of our CX uh, spinless fermion operators and then decompose them in terms of a, a pair of uh, Majorana fermion operators, which I'll label by A and B. So CX will be uh, gamma, uh, one half times gamma BX plus I gamma AX. So these gamma operators are, are called uh, Majorana fermion operators. They satisfy the following uh, properties. They're Hermitian operators, gamma dagger is equal to gamma. If you uh, square one of these operators, uh, you get the identity. And if you anti-commute any two distinct Majorana fermion operators, uh, you get zero. Okay, so these indices are uh, shorthand for A, B, X, and so those indices can differ either because you have different flavors, A, B, or because they're sitting on, on different sites. Uh, it's a useful exercise, if you haven't seen this before, to verify that um, the usual canonical fermionic anti-commutation relations that we all know and love are maintained when you uh, rewrite, when you use the right-hand side here, using these uh, Majorana properties. So for instance, Although these gamma operators square to identity, uh, you'll find that CX squares to zero and CX dagger squares to zero as it must because of Pauli exclusion principle. 
And uh, similarly, if you look at, for instance, anti-commutator between CX and CX dagger, you'll get one, as you should. All right, so there's really nothing special here uh, in, in the sense that uh, you can always take any uh, fermion operator and decompose it in terms of pair, pairs of Myron operators, as I've done here. doesn't matter if you're dealing with an insulator, metal, interacting, non-interacting system. This is just, uh, you're always free to do this. Um, it's loosely analogous to taking a complex number and just expressing it in terms of the real and imaginary parts. Okay, so gamma b is sort of like the real part of Cx, gamma a is like the imaginary part. You can also go the other way. So if, uh, you know, if I gave you two real numbers, you can always reassemble them into a complex number. Um, similarly, if, I, if, you, if you take any pair of Majorana fermion operators, you can always take superpositions and define some canonical fermion that defines a two-level system and that has a zero or one occupation number. So of course, you know, since this is so generic, it doesn't, you know, merely rewriting the, your operators in this fashion doesn't necessarily imply, and generally does not imply that, let's say, excitations and eigenstates of your system have a Majorana character. Right? That's usually not the case, and as we'll see, you, know, you need uh, special, uh, special situations in, in, in which uh, your you know, eigenstates of a system are naturally described in terms of Majorana operators. Okay, so that's the, that's the representation I'd like to now use. So let's just uh, uh, rewrite the Hamiltonian in this, uh, in this new Majorana language. So we have two kinds of terms. We, we have this uh, chemical potential term, and then we have this uh, joint hopping and pairing term. So let's start with the C, C dagger C. All right, so if I uh, just use the right-hand side here, I'll get two factors of a half. Let me pull that out front. So the CX dagger will give me a factor of uh, gamma B. And actually, let, let me suppress those X indices just for brevity. Uh, you'll get gamma B minus gamma A. When you take Hermitian conjugate, all, this, all that you need to do is uh, to change the plus I to minus I. And then from the C, you just get gamma B uh, plus I gamma A. OK, so we can just uh, expand out that product. We'll get a gamma b squared, which is just, uh, just one by virtue of that, uh, that equation. Uh, we'll get another, uh, well, from, from these terms, we'll, the plus or minus i's cancel out, and we'll get another factor of one from squaring gamma a. Uh, then from these two pieces, we'll get uh, i gamma b gamma a. And from these two, we'll get minus i gamma a gamma b. Okay, so I can uh, simply, so obviously the ones combine, but actually these two terms also combine. If I take this gamma A and anti-commute it past gamma B, this minus sign turns into a plus sign, then these two terms just add, giving me one half times one plus I gamma B times gamma A. Okay, so this is actually pretty useful uh, a form. So we know that C dagger C has eigenvalue 0, 1. Those are two possible occupation numbers. And if you're dealing with the Majorana representation, you can immediately see that I times a product of two Majorana operators. That's a Hermitian operator that has eigenvalues plus or minus 1. If this uh, combination gives minus 1, that corresponds to the state in which that fermion is unoccupied. Whereas if this is, has eigenvalue plus 1, then that corresponds to the state where this fermion is present. All right, so that's uh, half the Hamiltonian. Actually, the other half is much easier to represent in terms of Majorana operators. So the C dagger plus C, that just peels off the, the real part, and the C minus C dagger just peels off the imaginary part. Okay. Okay, so using um, this representation, we can write the Hamiltonian in the following form. So everything's going to have, I'll discard this factor of, of one, it's just a constant. So there's going to be a factor of i, um, an i from here, and there's going to be another factor of i from this piece. I'll pull that i all the way out front. Uh, there's also going to be a factor of, of one half, one from here and one from here. I'll also pull that factor out front. Okay, so I get minus i over 2, sum on x, 
mu gamma bx gamma ax plus t times gamma bx gamma ax plus 1. All right, so this is, again, that's just the real part of the fermion at site x uh, that couples to the imaginary part of the fermion at the next site over. OK, so this has a nice uh, pictorial representation. Uh, let me try to fit it in over here. All right, so I'm going to represent our original CX fermion operators of the box. And each, each one of those boxes will have two circles representing the a and B uh, Majorana fermion operators. So this is the A and this is the B. All right, so this is, let's say, the box for site one. There's the box for site two. And so on. And there's a box for site n. OK, so mu, we see, is, is coupling uh, A and B Myron operators on the same site. So let me indicate that with a, a little dashed line uh, within each box. But T uh, does something slightly different. So T couples the B Myron operator from one site with the A Myron operator from the next site over. So I'll, in I'll indicate that with lines labeled by T. OK, so that's the pattern of couplings that one, that one gets. And uh, so when you look at this uh, Kataev chain Hamiltonian from the lens of, of this Majorana fermion representation, you wind up getting uh, an equivalent uh, Majorana chain, some uh, array of Majorana operators, uh, where mu and t are favoring competing dimerization patterns for those operators. And this uh, probably looks familiar from, uh, from one of Charlie's slides uh, from yesterday. All right, so what I'd like to do now is, is get uh, revealing snapshots of these uh, gapped superconducting phases, the topological and trivial ones. Um, so I, I'll first look at, let's, so let's uh, put a point minus infinity. So I'd like to first look at um, mu over t equals minus infinity, which puts us you know, arbitrarily deep in the trivial phase. And then after that, I'll look at another special point so I'll call 2, which is, uh, corresponds to mu, mu over t equals 0, which puts us right in the center of the topological phase. How is time, by the way, Charlie? Um, we've got about uh, 25 minutes. Awesome. OK. Sounds good. All right, so let's see. I guess I'll erase here. Maybe I, sh I should pause. Any questions up till this point? Uh, yeah, overall shift for all states. Um, any other questions? All right, so let's, um, let's specialize to um, mu over t equals minus infinity. So to get mu over t equals minus infinity, I can take mu uh, less than 0 and, and t equal to 0. So if we uh, look at this pictorial representation of the uh, uh, Majorana representation of the Kataev chain Hamiltonian, I can basically just uh, turn off all these T couplings. So in this case, we're going to uh, get a unique ground state that actually has no entanglement between sites. between physical fermion sites, I mean. And that state, let me call it psi, 
Uh, that state, uh, if you think about the original uh, fermionic representation, uh, re representation, if I have mu less than zero and t equals zero, so ignore the bottom line, then it's very clear from that uh, picture that if mu is less than zero, the ground state is just a vacuum of CX fermions. Okay. Alternatively, if you want to use a Majorana language, you can, unfortunately, I had to erase the equation, but that uh, state that corresponds to the vacuum of CX fermions can also be described as a state where I times uh, gamma B gamma A is minus one for all sites, because that, that will give you the occupation number zero for all of your physical uh, CX fermions. Okay, so that's the unique ground state. Uh, and we can also see that there's a, a gap to any excitations. If you want to add a CX fermion, that costs uh, an energy mu. Okay, and that's compatible with what we already observed from the point of view of the periodic chain. Okay, so once again, that's about as trivial a state as you can, uh, as you can imagine. All right, so that's a simple snapshot of the trivial phase. So now let's do the same thing for the uh, um, snapshot of the topological phase by taking mu over t equals zero. So now I'm going to set mu equals zero, uh, but take t positive. So that will park me, uh, again, right in the center of this topological phase. So if you stare at the original CX representation, now you're ignoring uh, this first line and keeping the second line. And it's maybe not so obvious uh, what, what to make of things from this representation. But actually, if, uh, here's where the, the virtu virtues of this Majorana representation really uh, come to light. So the situation is now flipped. So previously, I, in the trivial phase, I ignored all the t-couplings and, and turned on mu. So now I'm going to do the opposite. So I, I have no mu-couplings, and I have only t-couplings. And so now, you know, contrary to what we saw for the trivial phase, uh, these, uh, these t-couplings will generate non-trivial entanglement between sites. And in order to expose the structure of the ground state and the excitations, it's going to be useful to define a new set of fermion operators. All right, so let me define fx to be 1 half times gamma ax plus 1 plus i gamma bx. So this is uh, not the same as the CX fermion. The CX fermion was always arising from superpositions of Majorana operators on the same site. These have different site indices. So these are uh, certainly not the same thing. And their corresponding occupation number uh, takes the form 1 half times 1 minus i gamma bx gamma ax plus 1. All right, so notice that um, the occupation number of these f fermions is intimately related to the, the t term. Actually, up to a constant, it is the t term right, that appears in our Hamiltonian, so, which is the only thing that we're considering. Um, now, the, these uh, set of f operators uh, that represent terms that are uh, appearing in this Hamiltonian don't fully exhaust all the degrees of freedom. Okay, so in particular, um, by staring at this picture, you can see that something special has happened at the left and right ends of the chain. Right, so there's one, uh, there's one Majorana operator at the extreme left end, which I'll call gamma 1. And there's another Majorana operator that's uh, occurring at the extreme right end that's also not coupled to anybody. So those are unpaired Majorana operators. And I can similarly assemble, um, take superpositions of gamma 1 and gamma 2 to, de to define yet another kind of uh, fermionic operator that has a 0, 1 occupation number. And let's call that operator D. So D will be 1 half times gamma 1 
plus i gamma 2. All right, so this d operator is similar to the, the FX fermion operators. It, again, has the 0, 1 occupation number. It has can canonical commutation relations. But it's uh, highly non-trivial in an important respect, which is that these are basically, you know, the Fs are arising from near sub sums of nearby Myron operators. The situation is qualitatively different for this D operator. Half of it is sitting at one end of the chain, and the other half is sitting, you know, arbitrarily far away at the other end of the chain. Right? So this is a very non-local uh, kind of, of fermion. So in the language of, that Charlie was using, you know, this is an example where you've split the impossible. You know, there's a single fermion, and half of its uh, wave function is at one end of the system, and the other half is, in principle, macroscopic distance away. Uh, quite amazing thing. All right, so if we, if we use uh, the, this new set of canonical fermions, we can rewrite this uh, t-only term in the Hamiltonian uh, as follows. All right, so again, discarding this trivial constant, uh, the t term will just give me uh, t times sum on f, uh, sorry, sorry, sum on uh, sites x, fx dagger uh, fx. And let me add something that's trivial, but I think is maybe con useful for just illustration. I'm going to add a 0 times d dagger d. Okay. All right, so th by staring at this uh, t term, we can see that there's a, uh, the ground state for the system it corresponds to the vacuum, not of original CX fermions, but rather of these uh, new FX fermions. And if you want to uh, add any FX fermions to the system, you have to pay an energy uh, cost of t to do so. Right. And this should not surprise us. You know, we, we already asserted from the uh, periodic chain that our, our, uh, our system was, was gapped, and this is just a a real space view of, of the gap nature of that topological superconducting phase. But uh, the ground state is not unique in this case, contrary to what you find for the, the, the trivial phase, because of these, uh, these d fermion operators. Okay? So you can add or remove one of these d fermion levels without changing the system's energy because they don't even appear in the Hamiltonian. Right? Right, so this is a weird uh, situation. Um, I probably should have used this nomenclature before, but I'm going to uh, refer to gamma 1 and gamma 2 as Majorana zero modes. Okay, and D is the canonical fermion operator that, super, uh, that uh, superposes uh, those Majorana zero mode operators. So, uh, ga uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2 do not distinguish between A kind of Majoranas and B kind of Majoranas. Is it important? Um, I don't think that's really important. So, you know, gamma 1 is just defined to be gamma A at site 1, and gamma 2 is defined to be gamma B at site N. But um, okay. uh, I mean, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll comment, I'll make a comment related to that uh, shortly. Um, okay. All right, so in this case, we have uh, a twofold ground state degeneracy. So let's catalog that degeneracy. So one of those states I'm going to call zero. And let's define zero to be the state where you have the vacuum of both fx fermions and d fermions. OK, so that's certainly a ground state. But we can define a second ground state, which I'm going to call one, by taking a zero and acting d dagger on that state. OK, so that will flip the occupation number of d from 0 to 1, but uh, that doesn't actually change the system's energy. OK, so these uh, states are uh, exactly degenerate by virtue of those uh, Majorana, Majorana zero modes. Um, OK, so by staring at these expressions, we can, we can emphasize an important feature of, of, of this problem, which is that uh, these states 0 and 1, they carry opposite global uh, fermion parity. So, you know, the, uh, again, from Rosera's uh, lecture, or really this week, her first lecture, you know, she showed you the BCS uh, wave function for a, a superconductor. You, know, you sum over um, 
let's say, zero, two, four, six, and so on, uh, electron number configurations. And these are you know, similarly kind of BCS wave functions. Uh, if, let's say, the state zero has uh, uh, always an even number of electrons, then the state one, because, it, because zero and one differ by the action of a single fermion operator, then the one state must uh, be a state that corresponds to an, having an odd number of electrons in your system. And we should pause to reflect on how weird that feature actually is. In conventional superconductors, if you, let's say, just look at a, a, a usual S-wave superconductor, um, what you'll find there is that the ground state wants to have an even number of electrons, typically. And th that's very intuitive, because if you have an even number of electrons, and every single electron in your system can find a, a, a partner to Cooper pair with. Right? And typically, if you want to have an odd number of electrons, that requires one electron which, which can't find a partner, and that usually costs you a finite energy, at least in gapped uh, superconductors. Right. But here we have a, super, a different situation. We have, a, a, once again, a gap superconducting phase, at least in the bulk, yet we have a, a degeneracy between having even and odd electron number states. Right. And that's really the physics of Majorana zero modes in this, in this context. They're removing the energy cost for adding a single uh, unpaired electron uh, to this system. All right, so now I'd like to... Um, make uh, several, several comments. Well, one is that um, I think it's quite interesting, actually, that the existence of these unpaired Majorana zero modes that we found um, is actually embedded in the entanglement structure for, for already for a periodic chain. And you can kind of see that from this sort of picture. You know, if I was going to take a, uh, take a, a Kataev chain in the topological phase and, and introduce a physical cut, you know, just chop the thing in two, you would always be uh, cutting one of these T-bonds and therefore, you know, exposing a, a pair of, of Majorana zero mode operators uh, at the opposite ends of that cut. And actually, this situation is, is uh, general to actually many topological phases. For instance, in the quantum Hall effect, uh, you know, we know that uh, any boundary that you have between, let's say, a quantum Hall state and vacuum, whether it's at the outer edge or a hole that you drill into the system, the presence of those edge states is already baked into the way that the uh, electrons are entangled in the ground state. Right? In, in some sense, the system knows that if you are going to make a cut, uh, th that something special is, is going to happen. Uh, another comment I'd like to make is that uh, you may be s a little bit worried about what I've done. Um, it, you know, there's uh, lots of fine-tuning, and fine-tuning is often a, a dangerous thing to re rely too heavily on. First, I took uh, um, delta equals t, which, you know, as I emphasized before, is a rather preposterous uh, limit to be considering it with real materials in mind. Um, and, and then I did further fine-tuning. I parked myself to mu equals zero, and that's you know, two, two, uh, uh, two bits of fine-tuning. And the reason I did that is, you know, in, in that limit, you, you s all this structure just falls out, and you, know, you understand everything at the level of pictures. Um, but it's important to ask, you know, what happens if I go to a more, uh, more general regime? Suppose I, I take mu not, not equal to zero and uh, t different from delta. Okay, so in that situation, as long as you stay in the topological phase, you will still have uh, Majorana zero modes uh, up to uh, some corrections, which I will comment on shortly. Um, so in the case that we identified here, uh, those Majorana zero-mode operators were just localized to a single site. Right? There's, uh, gamma 1 was, was parked at exactly at site 1, didn't have any communication uh, in, into the bulk, and similarly for gamma 2. But in a more generic situation, what one should expect is the following. If you have, a, let's say, a, a chain that has length L, those uh, Majorana zero-mode operators that are bound to the left and right ed ed ends in the topological phase will not be perfectly localized to one site, but rather they'll, uh, they'll decay exponentially uh, into the bulk over a length scale given by the uh, coherence length, which scales like h bar times the Fermi velocity divided by the bulk gap. Okay, so. In this more generic situation, you know, there's always going to be some exponentially small overlap in any, in any finite system between gamma 1 and gamma 2. They'll always know about each other to some uh, minuscule degree. And correspondingly, these uh, 0 and 1 states will not be exactly degenerate. Okay? They'll be split by by some amount. But that splitting, uh, crucially, will scale like e to the minus L 
over C, at least if, uh, if the system size is large compared to that uh, characteristic decay length into the bulk. All right, uh, saw some confused looks there, but uh, um, yeah, this is the kind of thing you have to work a bit harder to, uh, to see. Um, doesn't fall out like this uh, special limit, but uh, it's kind of the generic expectation that if you have a gapped phase uh, that has some characteristic coherence length, any states that are localized, let's say, to the edge will bleed, in on the bleed into the bulk on the scale of that correlation length. Another comment I want to make is that, um, oh, by the way, just uh, one more thing. Whenever you hear uh, more or less anybody talking about Majorana zero modes, topological degeneracy, and so on, uh, you should always interpret those, uh, those words as meaning you know, modulo exponentially small corrections of this type. That can be made you know, arbitrarily small by just making the system size uh, bigger and bigger. Could you elaborate a bit more about the um, characteristic uh, coherence lens or the decay lens? What is the depend of? Um, you mean this expression here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually the, f the familiar, um, well, I mean, I shouldn't say familiar. This is the, uh, the, the what's the word? Um, well, I guess for a BCS superconductor, this is the Ginzburg-Landau coherence length or the Peppard coherence length. Uh, so this is um, uh, the same kind of uh, characteristic length scale that you would expect for a, a, a non-topological BCS superconductor. Uh, I would say that you know it, it's almost uh, forced to have this form, at least if you know in, in the kind of simple models that I've I've taken here, where you have a very minimal set of parameters that can possibly appear uh, in that. Uh, expression for the correlation length. You know, I would uh, almost argue by, by dimensional analysis that it kind of has to have this form. Um, if you want to get some additional insight, you can uh, ask what happens as you go from, let's say, the topological phase into the, uh, into the trivial phase. Actually, th thanks for asking, because this is probably a useful, uh, useful thing to think about. Um, when you go from the topological to the trivial phase, as we identified previously, there's a, there's a phase transition and a gap closure that inevitably arises. Um, that corresponds to the situation in which C gap, uh, sorry, e, e gap goes to zero, and correspondingly, this uh, length scale goes to infinity. And you know, when that length scale goes to infinity, basically, the, uh, you lose any hope of ever separate, you know, having a physical separation between gamma one and gamma two. And that makes a lot of sense because you know, when you go from topological, topological to trivial, you lose the the notion of of, well def of protected Majorana zero mode edge states. Yeah, so basically, um, this is, I know this is a similar kind of scale for superconducting coherence lens, mm -hmm. but for Marana, is that uh, you use the same uh, superconducting gap or it's a different lens scale? Yeah, I mean, in practice, if you, let's say, look at real materials, this expression can be much more complicated. And there may be actually multiple length scales and different you know, exponentials that can kick in and, uh, um, in different regimes. Um, but I, I would say that the, the generic thing, the really universal part of this expression is that, you know, at, when the gap goes to zero, the correlation length has to diverge. So the localization length of these has to diverge. So that's the, th that's the thing that I would say is a universal feature uh, that holds, you know, even in uh, arbitrarily complex models, um, provided they're realizing the same phase. Okay, thank you very sure. much. No, E gap is, um, is the minimum of uh, square root of CK squared plus delta K squared. Um, yeah, that's important because, you know, if it was just delta, um, would, you wouldn't have a divergence. All right, so another important feature I want to emphasize, which is actually related to what I've, what I've said here, um, this degeneracy is robust to arbitrary uh, local perturbations that you might, uh, might introduce, so long as they don't um, close the gap for the phase and take you from a, you know, outside of the topological phase that allows these zero modes to appear in the first place. And so you can, I guess, view you know, changing mu from zero and t uh, from, from delta as, as one example of that. So, um, 
you know, this, uh, as I tried to argue, um, you'll still get at almost degeneracy modulo exponentially small corrections, but it, the, the idea is much more general. You can introduce a disorder, um, actually whatever you want, uh, as long as, you know, the per perturbations are, are small enough to uh, allow you to remain in the same phase, uh, you, will, you will find the same conclusion, okay? Namely, near degeneracy up to exponentially small corrections. And I think that makes some sense physically. So if you imagine that you've def you're, you start deforming your Hamiltonian in you know, God knows what, what way, um, what you might expect naturally happens is that the, the pattern of these uh, zero-mode wave functions changes. You know, maybe it can become much more complicated. But as long as, um, as, long as you remain uh, having some localization that, and, and, the, and with a system size that's large compared to that localization, there's no way to really appreciably change uh, the, this conclusion. Okay. Maybe the details, prefactors, and so on can change, but you should still have some exponential, exponentially small splitting. Conversely, you, know, you might ask, you know, what do I have to do in order to escape this? Okay, sounds good. What do I have to do to escape this exponentially small splitting? And uh, one thing you could do is, is uh, violate locality. So, for instance, if you imagined adding a, a process to your Hamiltonian where I, took an, I, had, I allowed an electron to, to hop from, let's say, the left all the way uh, to the right end of the chain, then you, you can get a, you know, order one coupling between gamma one and gamma two, but you gave up something sacred, namely locality, in order to do that. Okay. So again, as long as you preserve locality, this is, uh, um, that degeneracy is sacred. So the final comment I wanted to make, and maybe I should, yeah, please. So if you take an Ising chain, do mapping to hard core bosons, and then Jordan Wigner, we also get a Kitaev chain. Yeah. Uh, but I heard that the Meyer remotes are not real. And is, is the reason that they are not real because of the non-locality in Jordan Wigner? Yeah, I love oh. this question. I think this okay. is a very, very uh, uh, interesting and, and important question to really appreciate what is special here. So this Hamiltonian is the uh, transversal Ising model in disguise. And uh, this twofold ground state degeneracy, if you think about transverse field Ising language, this, let's say the zero state would be, um, I think, the Schrodinger cat superposition of all up plus all down in the, in the ferromagnetic phase, and the one would be the Schrodinger cat superposition of all up uh, plus all down. And so, you know, given this mathematical equivalence between the models, you might ask, well, you know, if I'm interested in pursuing this kind of physics, you know, why don't I just give up on finding realizations of one-dimensional spinless superconductors and just, you know, put all my eggs into the basket of pursuing transverse field Ising chains, which is certainly going to be much easier, uh, easier to do. Um, the problem is that, you know, it really matters a great deal whether your physical degrees of freedom are fermions versus spins, because the rules of the game change, and it's related to what you, you know, the, the fact that there's a non-local mapping that takes you between the two. So, for instance, in the, in the transverse field Ising model, I can very easily open up an order one splitting between those, uh, those states, uh, with local perturbations. For instance, you know, a sigma z field um, would easily do that. Um, but the important point is that uh, that perturbation, that sigma z perturbation that easily splits the degeneracy for an Ising chain becomes non-local by virtue of the jordan Wigner transformation when you express that in terms of fermionic language. Okay, mm, okay I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. All right, so another um, closely related property uh, to the um, robustness of that ground state degeneracy is that uh, local measurements, um, again, if we ignore these exponentially small splittings, cannot actually discriminate between the zero and one state. Um, and I think there's, there's various ways of, of understanding why that uh, must be the case. Um, so, you know, for instance, suppose you wanted to infer uh, whether your system was in the zero or one state. In our, you know, those states differ only in the occupation number of this D-fermion, but these, this D-fermion involves a superposition of gamma 1 and gamma 2, which are macroscopic distances apart. And if you wanted to, to know the occupation number that, of that D-fermion, you would have to necessarily do a non-local measurement that knew simultaneously about both ends of the system. You need to do something that knows both about uh, gamma 1 and gamma 2. There's, I think, a maybe more physical way of, of uh, phrasing this, which is that I mentioned that you know, zero had an even number of electrons, for, for instance, and one ha uh, would have an odd number of electrons. And if you wanted to, to know which of those states your system was populating, you would need to basically count all the electrons in your system, mod two, and then 
and then figure, and then you, you would be able to infer uh, whether you're in the zero or one, or one state. But clearly, you know, the global fermion parity of, of a superconductor is not information that you can in, infer by a local measurement. Okay. All right, so that, you know, resilience of this uh, degeneracy and the uh, uh, closely related property that you can't actually tell which of those states your system's populating via local measurements is uh, highly desirable for storing quantum information in that subspace. Um, so maybe one thing I, I can say is that uh, one thing that, you know, one, one has to wrestle with with uh, conventional non-topological qubits is dephasing. So, for instance, you know, if you have uh, a zero and one uh, levels which are split by some energy, if that energy wiggles as a function of time, that produces dephasing errors and, you know, finite T2. Um, but here, you know, the wiggling of these of this zero and one state is, is constrained to be basically exponentially small uh, by virtue of the intrinsic resilience of that degeneracy. And so you have kind of automatic uh, suppression against dephasing errors within, you know, some, some theoretical... Uh, uh, limitations. Okay, so I'll, I'll say more about uh, uh, applications to quantum information and topological qubits um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but maybe I should stop here. I think this is a reasonable stopping point. Um, but yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. So we have time for a few more questions before the break. Yeah, thanks for the nice Blackboard lecture. Um, I was wondering for the periodic boundary condition system, it has the trivia on the topological state. Uh, suppose you were to realize it experimentally, how would you rule out the difference? Because there's no domain wall, so no localized states, right? Oh, on a periodic chain? Yeah. Um, well, I think that's... Uh, if you really want to maintain periodicity, I, I, I think you probably have a very hard time, which is actually a feature rather than a bug. You know, you shouldn't be able to do local measurements that really uh, diagnose whether a, a state is topological or trivial. Um, there's, you know, there's other kinds of things you could do. You could, let's say, uh, make a... I, I'm not sure if this is cheating, but you could imagine um, making a Joseph's injunction, uh, you know, using a, 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 a chain that's, uh, that's, you know, wrapped onto a ring and then introducing a, a phase winding and um, that kind of experiment could, gi could give you information on whether your system was topological or trivial. Um, yeah, that's probably the best thing I can think of off the fly for what, what you would do for a, a periodic chain. And, and my answer is probably very cryptic, but uh, I hope to have time on my last lecture tomorrow to go over uh, some related Joseph's in physics. Um, Thank you. Hey, yeah, thanks for the talk. So. I mean, the, in the case where you set uh, T equal to uh, the delta, uh, I mean, the, the way you wrote it down in the beginning, because of the, uh, the I, I guess, I mean, the symmetry is different of the two, right? So in, in this picture, is the, is the parity of the gap function absorbed into the, the I in front of the Majorana operators, or where did it go? Um, okay, so I'm not quite sure what uh, what symmetry you have you have in mind. Do you mean? Um, or I mean, the, it must be P wave, right? The yeah, that's right. Okay, and when you set, but I mean, a hopping is not. I mean, a hopping is has S symmetry, I guess, right? Um, I'm not sure that I would necessarily subscribe to that uh, to that nomenclature. I mean. Um, you can ask, you know, what symmetry should I have imposed here uh, in the first place? I mean, that, that, that's the way I would prefer to, um, to, to phrase this problem. And uh, essentially, I was, I was enforcing no symmetries, um, kind of allowing for, uh, you know, I mean, I was imagining that we should allow for arbitrary perturbations, except for reflection symmetry. I think I did want to maintain, you know, k to minus k uh, symmetry in, in, the, uh, in the band structure. But apart from that, I didn't want to enforce any symmetries. Um, and you know, with the rules of the game, you know the the uh, the, hop in, the hopping and pairing terms are equally equally valid uh, terms that you know all respect the, the physical symmetries of my problem, which are basically no symmetries. Uh, oh, okay. I thought it must be you must put p wave uh, for that. The, that's uh, not that's kind of constrained to you uh, on you not necessarily by symmetry, but by poly exclusion principle. Uh, so maybe I can say something a little bit more about that. So. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so the, the form that I wrote down had, had looked like, uh, in momentum space, uh, had this structure, right? Now, um, these two pieces are actually odd under taking k to minus k, because there's no spin label there. Okay. So in order for this to survive, that also has to be odd under taking k to minus k. Oh, okay. And that's, that's it, right? It, it's, just, it's forced on us by uh, the spinlessness of our fermions. Oh, okay. um, there's, no, there's no kind of uh, symmetry uh, requirement. Yeah, well, it's like in the, in the way you write down the Bugler of the gen Hamiltonian, I guess, right? Um, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess so, but I mean, it's, it's really just, uh, even, even in this form, you can see that it has to be the case. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the, call, the talk. Uh, maybe this is a naive question, but uh, two things: uh, could be able, or could we be able to measure the charge uh, of these zero modes, and could we be able, be able to measure the charge in both ends, and what would it be? Um, okay, so so the charge. Uh, I don't think they have a, a charge. Um, so you know these Myron and zero mode operators kind of by definition are equal superpositions of electron and hole operators. So in that sense, you know they're they're chargeless. Um, uh, on oh, well, tomorrow I will uh, describe some ways of of probing both the existence of of zero modes using transport and also, uh, time permitting, uh, a way of actually revealing the information encoded in the, the quantum state encoded in a, in a pair of Myron uh, zero modes. Um, but maybe I, uh, I guess I can say a little bit more now as a preview, but um, uh, do I have time? Uh, um, very quick, then we need to get to break. So let's just get to the break. Uh, so Thanks a lot. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Let's, uh, let's take a break, and we're, we're going to come back at 11.40, so, so we're running a little bit late. Sorry. <laughs>